Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Today, I'd like to talk about Dean and Wendy Brown's second cosmic law, the principle of contraries, or sometimes known as the principle of the progression of contraries. Now, yesterday in the In Present segment, I introduced you briefly to Dean Brown and the principle of nothingness, that everything originates in nothingness, everything returns to nothingness. And I talked about how mathematically you can take zero and it's actually minus one plus plus one equals zero. So, out of zero, you can get all of the other numbers, minus two, plus two, etc. And when we think about the creation of the universe, the Big Bang, before the Big Bang, there was nothing. And then, all of a sudden, this huge explosion and a universe appeared. How did that happen? How did this vast universe emerge out of nothing? And cosmologists sometimes suggest that it happened this way. Just like the plus one and the minus one, you had matter and antimatter being created. Well, when, enter matter, <laughs> when matter and antimatter collide, they destroy each other, they annihilate each other, they return back to nothing. And so, the suggestion is that uh, there was this huge explosion of matter and antimatter and uh, most of it uh, collided and uh, returned back to nothing, but a certain amount of antimatter and matter have yet to collide with each other and that's why we're in this universe of matter right now. So, that would be uh, probably the primordial example of the principle of contraries, matter and antimatter, and perhaps even before that, mathematically, the pluses and the minuses in, in terms of not only number, but then you get electric charge as, as well. So, the, the notion of this principle is that everything, for everything, there is a contrary. Now, I'm going to explore that idea a little further, but before I do so, let me tell you a little bit about my friend, Dean Brown. He was just such a wonderful influence in my life, truly a renaissance man, a man of many, many talents. He had his doctorate in physics. He was a uh, nuclear scientist. He worked uh, for a while in his youth at the uh, Center for Advanced Studies in Princeton and there he got to know Albert Einstein. In fact, he used to play Go, one of my favorite games with Albert Einstein. Neither of them, frankly, were very good at Go. I could beat Dean easily at Go and I'm not a great Go player. But they were exploring the game of Go in order to get a better handle on John von Neumann's game theory, which was a very hot topic then back in the 1950s. Dean was also an entrepreneur. In fact, he was one of the founders of the Zilog Corporation that manufactured one of the very first microcomputer chips, the Z80 chip that he helped to design. Uh, as I uh, understand it, they're still manufacturing that chip after so many, many years. It was the basis of, for some of the very uh, early uh, powerful computers. He was a Sanskrit scholar. In fact, he understood, as I recall, more than 20 different languages. And uh, he translated the Upanishads. His translation of the Upanishads was published by the uh, University of Philosophical Research, the Philosophical Research Society. He it was also a student of the world's well, I have to put it this way. He was a student of everything, of everything, believe it or not. He believed that you would find God in all of the particulars of the universe. One day, I was walking with him in uh, an area of California in Marin County known as the Tennessee Valley. And we were walking along the road and he was just naming every plant that we passed on, on this trail. And I said to him, Dean, my goodness, you seem to know every plant here in California. I said, there must be 10,000. 
And he said to me, well, he said, it is true. I do know them all. He said, it's only about 7,000, actually. Um, he said, but I also know all of the plants in the United States. That would be about 10,000. And of course, that wasn't his major hobby or, or major occupation. Dean and his wife, Wendy, collected grass from all over the world. They loved to look at the different varieties of grass. So once when I visited Papua New Guinea, I, I brought some grass back as a souvenir for Dean and Wendy. He also is the person who introduced me to the field of financial forecasting and trading. He had a system. He was making quite a bit of money. And one day he decided to show it to me and he got me hooked. And ever since then, I've been working with neural networks and computer systems for financial forecasting. But he was truly, above all, deeply interested in finding the invariance the things that were constant when you look all across nature. What are the things that never change? And these are the cosmic principles that he and Wendy have enunciated in his book. So the principle, the first one, as I mentioned, is the principle of nothingness, that everything originates and returns to nothingness, a very dynamic nothingness, I would say. And now, I've introduced to you the principle of contraries. What does that mean for you? For example, many of you hold, and I do, hold strong political views. I do. I'm a lifelong liberal Democrat, as I've mentioned many times. But I appreciate, according to the principle of contraries, there is an equal and opposite position to the one I hold. Now, I happen to think it's the wrong position, but I'm well aware of the fact that people who hold that position think that my position is the wrong position. So, I need to take that into account. And the great philosopher George Wilhelm Hegel, I hope I have his middle name correct, uh, came up with the idea of how ideas evolve. You have a thesis. Every thesis generates an antithesis. And then, when you have a thesis and antithesis, you end up eventually with a synthesis. So, in the realm of politics, that happens all of the time. That's why they say politics makes strange bedfellows. You have people on the opposite end of a political spectrum but they often discover that they see things of value in each other's positions. And what emerges is often a new synthesis. And then that synthesis becomes a thesis that then generates a new antithesis. And that's why Dean and Wendy, I believe, refer to the progression of contraries, because these contraries become ever more sophisticated as the, uh, dis the as these discussions, as these arguments, as these conversations progress. And that's a good thing. So, if I was to say to myself, well, if everything has a contrary, what's the contrary of me? What's the contrary of you? That's pretty hard to find because we are already so complex, so composed of so many different contraries. I mean, maybe the contrary of me is an electron. I don't know for sure. <laughs> or maybe the contrary of me is a person who is like me in uh, some ways, but the opposite of me in other ways. Or maybe there are many different contraries because I am, as every human being is, so many different things at once. For me, the lesson in all of this, and I hope you will take it to heart as a lesson, is not to be too wedded to any given stance, any given position, because there's an equal and opposite stance out there somewhere. Some of you think that men are absolutely superior to women. Some of you may think that women are absolutely superior to men. I think you can make a good argument either way. But as the contraries progress, the arguments necessarily must become more and more subtle, more and more nuanced. There are people who 
such as myself, who believe the evidence for parapsychological phenomenon is overwhelming. There are other people who believe it doesn't even pay to look at the evidence because these things are impossible to begin with. So whatever evidence uh, is purported to exist, it must be uh, erroneous in some way. No need to even bother looking at it. Now, I tend to think that one position is absolutely correct and the other position is absolutely false. But the thing about the principle of contraries is that like the yin-yang, there's a little bit of yin in every yang and a little bit of yang in every yin. Every opposite contains within itself the seed of its own contrary. So, for example, with good and evil. There's some good that comes out of every evil. There's some bad or evil that comes out of every good. These things are, at least at this point in the history of the evolution of uh, humanity on this planet, uh, things have already become so interwoven and so complex. I hope you'll give these thoughts some consideration and ask yourself, are there things that you hold to that you believe are so well established in your life that there is no contrary for them? Maybe it would be useful to begin to look for contraries if you think there are none. I'll leave you with that thought and thank you for being with me.